translation and the margins will be discussed from two perspectives. Firstly, the idea of translation being a marginal activity and therefore occupying only a peripheral position in what uh, the Israeli linguist and translation theorist Itamar Ivan Zohar would call the literary polysystem or what Pascal Casanova, the French uh, literary critic, might call the world republic of letters. So firstly, this idea of the marginality of translation in the overall scenario of literary activities and literary field, if you want. Secondly, the different margins, uh, she'll talk about the different margins or marginalized identities with which translation must necessarily engage, especially in the context of India. Uh, Professor Dechamma's reflections will also help us look at the possibilities that translation has opened up in the 20th and 21st centuries and its future potential. Uh, Professor Soumya Dechamma, CC, teaches at the Center for Comparative Literature, University of Hyderabad. Apart from teaching comparative Indian literature and cultural discourses in contemporary India, her research interests include literature of in, literatures of India, translation studies, minority languages and cultural discourse, and Kodawa performative cultures. She joined the center in 2004, and prior to teaching in the University of Hyderabad, she taught English in Jamia Milia Islamia in New Delhi. She was awarded the Fulbright Nehru Academic and Professional Excellence Fellowship for 2019-20. During this Fulbright, she taught the course Modern Indian Literary Cultures and conducted research on understanding the modern in Queen's College, City University of New York. Her articles have appeared in international journals and national newspapers. She has a book, Cinemas of South India, published by OUP. And another book, uh, Languages of Modernity, is forthcoming again from OUP. So I would like to thank Professor Soumya for uh, agreeing to do this. And I think uh, you can start speaking from it. Thank you, uh, Gaurav, and uh, a very uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, uh, I see only girls. Uh, are, is the rest of the class girls too? Uh, it is overwhelmingly a class of girls, except okay. one student who has not been there since a long time. For some uh, okay. Uh, I'll try and share the PPT. Just a second. Yes, thank you. Okay. Fine. okay. So, uh, as uh, Gaurav just mentioned, uh, this is a very, uh, I mean, although I've been teaching translation for quite some time, uh, uh, and not maybe in the last two years, I haven't taught a course on translation or translation studies, but uh, the course, what I have taught so far has always had elements of the margin. Although I have taught it uh, using different essays and uh, using different uh, thinkers, philosophers, I hadn't put together all what I had read and what I understood into one uh, frame of translation and the margin. So uh, I thought, especially because you're an undergrad class, uh, I'll start from my own understanding of translation and uh, uh, then move on to uh, how translation is itself perceived as a margin and then how translation engages with other margins. This is what uh, also what I had uh, mentioned in the abstract, right? Uh, but since we have enough time and if you're not hungry, uh, you can stop me in between. Your questions need not, or clarifications need not uh, come at the end of the talk, but you can just stop me uh, uh, and then uh, go on to ask whatever you want to ask. Uh, so here is the first uh, slide that I have. How do we think about translation, right? Uh, uh, I have looked at uh, the course outline that uh, Garo had prepared, but then I don't know what uh, was the finalized uh, course outline. What are the essays you read and uh, what are the discussions you have had, right? Uh, right now, I just know that you did talk of translator. Uh, so also theoretical, Benjamin's uh, article is both theoretical and also addresses practical kind of uh, issues. So is translation practical, theoretical? I'm sure you would have discussed this in your class. Uh, and translation studies, for example, tries to bridge this uh, 
uh, never ending debate of whether transition studies should do only should deal only with the practical uh, necessities of translating from one language to the other or are there any you no know, theoretical issues are there how do we uh, deal with the many many theoretical issues that crop up even while we engage in practical translation or even without engaging in practical translation right so myself for example i have translated but not published translation although something is in the process so far i haven't published any translation although i can deal with four languages but i teach i theorize translation studies so how do we position ourselves do we look at translation only from the practical kind of a, a practice or engage with theory as well can somebody who doesn't practice translation talk theorize come up with new kinds of uh, you no know, uh, frameworks for translation so how do we deal with this is one question but i'm sure all of us have different kind of uh, you know thoughts around these ideas but for me as of now translation is both practical theoretical and also everything in between and beyond practical and theoretical as well so the second question which i have is do we deal only with textual translation by text i mean text that is written right or uh, written in a particular language so but i am sure you are aware that by text we could mean films performance singing day to day practices uh, our customs rituals everyday ness of our lives right anything is a text that can be studied so how do we understand translation is it based only on the written textual kind of a translation from one language to the other or do we consider translation in or of other forms visual oral and other forms as well and are these or related right that's another question you could ask we could discuss and more importantly for this talk uh, i would want you to think around how we can contextualize translation and its implication to the world of literature right pretty much like pascal casanova did and pretty much like uh, many others have been doing and how do we contextualize translation in the context of religion i'm sure you would have done this uh, uh, especially when you are talking about um, now bible translation which we will touch upon in a little while third cultural histories maybe in plural cultural histories right how central translation is to our own cultural histories and of course society at large so uh, when we talk about textual and other forms of translation the implication is much larger than a translation from one language to the other and this is what uh, this is where the talk today is pitched and i'm sure uh, many of you are aware of translation implications in these areas this is in okay so the first uh, slide is is the on my screen the uh, whatever the small icon is uh, hiding parts of the presentation is that happening on your screen as well it is quite clear for us okay fine then so what is translation so for me every translation is a translation of meaning it's not a translation as you have read of word to word sentence to sentence and so on and so forth but it is meaning that is translated and by meaning i also uh, want to be very clear that meaning is the way we comprehend a representation right so something that makes a particular meaning for me may make may make a totally different meaning for you so meaning itself is representation right 
and in that sense uh, translation is meta linguistic and this is also uh, roman yakubson's uh, from roman yakubson uh, who uh, in his um, what is that essay's name uh, linguistic sorry linguistic sorry translation Roman yes, 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 yes. Roman Jakobson's linguistics aspect of uh, translation, where he uh, talks about translation as a meta linguistic activity. Basically, translation as an activity that goes beyond the aspects of the language. Right? It doesn't stick to grammar. It doesn't stick to uh, many forms or many uh, rules that linguistics gives us. It goes beyond linguistics and therefore it is meta linguistic. So translation is a meta linguistic activity. So obviously, because it is meta linguistic, because it is not just restricted to language issues, it is representation, right? When you translate a short story from Tamil or Telugu or a novel, Bama's Karuku, if you look at, or even if you look at uh, uh, Perumal Murugan's uh, works in uh, uh, recent works, you all, I'm sure, are familiar with Perumal Murugan. So Perumal Murugan's works, when it is translated from Tamil to English, right, there is a representation of a particular Tamil identity, particular Tamil culture into English, which is carried over from that particularity to a much larger context. So it's not just that the novel is translated, but there is a representation of a whole lot of things, of a region, of a people, of gender, of caste, or whatever that Murugan is writing about, right? So translation represents, carries over representation from one particular set of things to another. And it is also interpretation as evident any reading. It's not just translation, uh, I'm sure you'll agree that any literature is itself interpretation, right? So pretty much on those lines, you also have translation as interpretation. The translator himself or herself or themselves are interpreters of what they read and what they translate, right? Every reader is an interpreter and translator is the most intimate reader. Now, I think... Uh, that is also from somebody, if not Spivak, it's somebody else. Translation is the most intimate act of reading, right? It, you have to read very closely. You have to be very intimate with the text in order to translate. So <clears throat> literature, as I said, is also representation and interpretation. And what this does is bring into question the questions of the author, the question of the reader, and also the question of the context. So when we talk about translation as representation, when we talk about translation as interpretation, it's not just the author and the reader, but also the context, right? We are interpreting things in a particular context, and therefore that needs to be foregrounded. So now the next point is where I want to mention how it's not just a written text that uh, where translation is significant, but also translation as a cultural text, right? Translation as a cultural process, not just in literature, but also in many disciplines, especially within anthropology which and sociology, which use ethnography, studying human beings, studying human cultures, studying human society, where you observe participate, right? Ethnography. These are the two main methods through which human society is studied. Um, ethnography, participation and observation, although there are other methods that are being uh, used now. So what happens in observation and participation? As a researcher, I observe, I participate, I look, I experience, and then I write down. So when I write down, and when I hear people talking, when I observe people talking, they're talking in some other language, right? Much of anthropology is about people who are different from us. So they're talking a different language. They practice different culture. Their everyday lives are different. And we listen to them, look at them, observe them, and write in a language that is totally different from what we have seen and what we have experienced, right? Right? 
history is also like that so history of some place some region some language happening somewhere in some age and we are writing it in some other language it's not that we are writing it about it in some other language the perception of that particular practice culture historical moment to the people involved is very different from how i as a researcher or a translator is perceiving it so there are various levels of translations involved in ethnography and history and what i want to uh, when emphasize is that translation is very very central to anthropology history and perhaps every other discipline it's just that it's not acknowledged but it is so <clears throat> this is just a extension of points which uh, uh, i mentioned about translation of what we see what we hear what we observe what we think all these things are thoughts and our observations we translate into either written words or spoken words or also in other forms you can translate it into a painting you can translate it into a film and so on and so forth so this is why ak ramanujan i don't know if you're uh, familiar with his uh, uh, essay on translation which is called 300 ramayanas right uh, there are he brings in versions of ramayanas uh, 300 versions or more and talks about using the terms telling or retelling transplantations transpositions but not translation right so <clears throat> why does he use sorry yeah so again this is just uh, mm -hmm. uh just the different forms where uh, translation can be considered as very significant right it's also oral to written what you are speaking when you write it is a translation from written to oral is also a translation written oral plays dance dramas performances culture what's in your you know what you're thinking about you express it in various forms shadow play songs films and a whole lot of other signifiers so ramanujan talks about all these uh, <clears throat> jhans forms as translation as undergoing as emerging from the process of translation so can we understand all these ways of tellings and retellings as translation ramanujan says yes and uh, i pretty much agree with him so why is this term telling preferred right because when we talk of translation now you are aware that if i give you one poem or a short story to the nine of you in the class and ask you to translate it into whichever language let's say all of you speak tamil in tamil we will have nine different versions of that poem right these are this is not just a speculation many people have actually uh, conducted a study conducted studies like this giving one poem to let's say 10 french speakers and each of those translations in french will be different from the other right and therefore translations are usually called as variants but there is a problem with calling translation a variant because variants suggest that there is an invariant something which is the original and which is sacrosanct which is not changeable right this original is unchangeable in this kind of an understanding that one telling is a variation a different version of the original unlike these telling doesn't validate one version so the term the concept of telling right it's a telling and therefore it it doesn't mean that there is something that is untold there are many tellings that are present it doesn't posit one single variant or many variants as against one original that is ever static not changing note that this telling suggests the democratic changeable nature of orality right why is it orality because all of us can tell anybody who can hear can listen to any story and tell it accordingly whereas a written version it's quite a privileged version of knowledge you have to be trained in 
reading, writing, and translating. Whereas oral forms are accessible to everyone. If you are able to hear, if you are able to see, you can retell, tell versions of the stories or your own experiences. Right. So telling is much more democratic. Orality is much more democratic in that sense. In fact, uh, you are also aware that Valmiki is Ramayana he is a telling of Ramayana, of which many oral versions were already present. Right. What Valmiki did supposedly is to gather these uh, different versions, different tellings. Sorry, not different versions, but perhaps different tellings, and then put it down on in writing. So, yes, telling can change according to who is writing, who is telling, who is performing, who the audience is, who the patrons are, who the publisher is, where it is sold. Of course, writing can also change according to all this context, right? It's not just telling that can change. Writing also can change according, can change according to these contexts. Are, uh, am I clear until here? I can. I this is one small part of uh, the presentation. So, if you want to uh, ask anything until what I have gone through so far, yeah. I'm fine with that. Any, any questions so far? Anybody? No? I think we can continue. Shall I go ahead? Yeah, you can. Uh, again, um, as I said, uh, these are the, uh, this is kind of a very, what the slide you see on the screen is a very uh, basic uh, kind of understanding of translation, right? Uh, because for long, or even if you ask today, even within academics, right? Even within practitioners of translation, even among authors, you see translation as being understood as secondary, not the primary. Translation is a secondary act. Translation is uh, not as creative as the quote-unquote original is. Right? So I have just listed down a whole lot of things uh, as to how translation is perceived. So secondary as against the primary original reproduction, right? Translation is a reproduction of the text that already exists. Right? It's a reproduction. It's not a new production. It's not as authentic as the original. Imitation, translation is always understood as an imitation as against the original. It is also seen as a craft and not art in itself, right? Uh, craft is something lower in the hierarchy as against uh, art. I mean, this is not just uh, in the field of literature, but if you look at uh, people who are said to be involved in uh, craft making, whether it is carpenters, blacksmiths, to some extent, goldsmiths are called artists because of the value gold has, but otherwise, if you look at... Uh, you know, uh, people who involve in iron, wood, and other not so valuable uh, material, they are you know, talked about as craftsmen, craftspeople, as against artists. Right? Translation pretty much falls in that kind of a category. And you have to be faithful as a translator and not creative like the author. And translation is Within especially linguistics, very hardcore, uh, conventional kind of linguistics, it's seen as a science, right? Because you have to stick to the text given in translating. Therefore, it is science and not art or imagination. And whenever you talk about translation, there is a tendency to talk about what is lost in translation. Of course, there's a film of that name. Uh, have you watched it? Which one is it? No, lost yes. in translation. If I'm, have you yeah. shown it, Kishore? In the no, no, no. I think okay. one of us has seen it. Okay, one lost in translation. I'm, I'm myself not seen it. Uh, if I should confess, I haven't seen it. Either. I just know it's there. So, um, so a loss of meaning, the meaning of the original, 
and also a loss of creativity, right? It's talked about in terms of loss or a lack. And then translation is also a venture that foregrounds untranslatability. So <clears throat> instead of focusing on the gains that translation can give us, it reaches out, translation reaches us, right? There is always a focus on what is untranslatable. There are so many things that are untranslatable and the focus is on that. I mean, if you ask me, you can talk about untranslatability and loss only when you know two languages, right? And this has to be a very elite kind of a reader, one who can read and write in two languages. Why do I read translations from Tamil? Because I can't read Tamil. Now, when I can't read Tamil and only have access to Murugan through translation, I just don't have any clue about what is untranslated, what is lost. It's only a gain for me that I read Murugan, right? Now, if you want to read texts from all over India, I'm sure definitely nobody can do it, right? There are hundreds of languages, hundreds, millions of translations. And so this aspect of untranslatability doesn't actually hold water, much water. Something that cannot bring out equivalence. This point is very similar to untranslatability and loss, right? Translation is always seen as something that never can equal the original. Right? The equivalence is never possible. It's only a close approximate, courtesy NIDA, if I'm not wrong. So translation is again looked at as decoding and recoding. You have to decode the meaning of the original and recode it in another language, but never as coding itself, right? never as original itself. This point is mentioned, variant as against invariant, and the invariant unchanging original is very very sacred impure as against the sacred or the pure original sacred i mean this people may not talk about translation as very impure but then the original sacred is always associated with a certain kind of purity right so conceptually if not uh, uh, put it down in words in those very terms now, what would you notice in these 13 points that I have mentioned? And uh, I might have missed many things around translation, but I would like any of you to respond. I don't know if I can hear you, but yeah, Kishore can just tell me. Yeah. Anybody would like to respond to this? What, what would one notice in the previous 13 points? What's the general pattern that comes across in these points? Yeah, I'll, I'll get the mic, please. No, no. Yes, and you can pass it on. Can you hear her, Samya? Not so far. Well, no, you can't? Okay, I think I'm sorry. You have to come up here. Uh, no. She'll come up here. Yes, she has a response. She'll come up here to the mic. There's a mic here. You can stand. Not working. Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? Hello. Yeah, I can. Yeah. So I, close it. I think uh, what, what, what I noticed, and which is also something that we have been discussing, is that um, like there's no kind of like romantic value placed on the original in all of these points. And it's kind of like the, there is like the, the creativity of the adaptation and the or the translation is sort of held at, at like a forefront. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank Anybody? you. Uh, Yeah. Anyone else? You'll have to come up here. Yeah, come, come. It's okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Louder, please. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, very low, but I can. Um, okay, so basically, I would think that um, because there's so much of importance given to the original, translation is not given any... Um, upstanding in the fact that it's venturing something that's not that easy. Instead, it's given a lesser standing because it's considered lesser than the original and also much more, like it's not, you can't directly translate something perfectly. So because of that, it's not given as much importance as it should be. Okay. Yes. Uh, that's pretty much uh, 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 very, very agreeable. And, uh, you know, uh, that's right. 
translation never has had the same value as the original right it's always seen in relation to the original it's not seen as a text of its own right there is no text of its own other than the original so juxtaposed against the original and almost always in a negative sense in a sense that posits lesser value to the translation than to the original so that's what you have noticed and that is what has been for at least some time or at least since the times when academic disciplines uh, of literature of trans or any other discipline has been institutionalized right translation can never be equal it's always lesser than the original it's always talked in negative terms right loss untranslatable um, no equivalence uh, so a whole lot of terms are negative in their purpose so <clears throat> translation therefore can never have an identity of its own so when it doesn't have an identity the <clears throat> next point that uh, automatically follows is it's seen as the other of the original right always the secondary kind of second citizen who can never be the ideal you can see that happening in uh, all across the world including india right people who aspire to be citizens like anybody else but who can never reach the ideal translation is very much like that translation is never seen as a significant central activity that has actually shaped our world right in fact if you take a whole lot of i can give you a whole lot of examples we can talk about whole lot of examples about how translation has shaped our world right but despite translation being a very very central activity since times immemorial it has been relegated to the margin periphery right and at the service of the original as the margin that just foregrounds its its function is like the moon right it just foregrounds the original it just plays out the light from the sun it cannot shine by itself right so despite the way as i said translation has shaped the world can you give me one example of how translation has been central in our cultural or in our day to day world the actual translation oh you mean the translation of a text or a yes, written yes 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 okay. anybody yeah uh, you have to come here Yeah, response. Um, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. like, um, like as in like college, like studying like philosophy, like a lot of like the pre-Socratic texts have been translated into English so that they're easy to understand. So I guess like a lot of like important texts in different disciplines are generally like translated texts. So like a lot of like, yeah. So. that's one reason like why it's like important in our day to day life yes very much so uh, in fact if you are reading aristotle aristotle didn't write in english right if you are reading plato no but people all around the world read it and are influenced or critique it or whatever they engage with aristotle and plato in different ways but we read them in translation i am not even sure if uh, you know uh, uh, greeks can understand the greek in which aristotle and plato wrote right so the language and translation whether it is aristotle or uh, plato or the most the biggest example that people cite is the translation of bible right bible is the most translated text in the world and most translated in the most number of languages and it's not just a religious kind of a mission with which bible was translated but it was also a colonizing mission it also had implications to the caste system in india the translation of bible so christianity was taken to different parts of the world not necessarily as a religious mission also as a religious mission but also as a colonizing mission and 
from a small number of people in Europe, Christianity has traveled to the Americas, North and South, Africa, Asia, pretty much everywhere via translation. Now, how has it changed the world is something that people have written, but all of us can think about it as well. Right? So, biblical translation, not just biblical, translation of works from Sanskrit and Indian languages about how even when somebody translates Gita, Bhagavad Gita, for Hindu believers, how that is something not as pure as the original law. What is the original? I have no clue. Even Bible, there is no way one can pinpoint at the original Bible, right? These are contentious issues. These are just tellings and therefore there is very difficult to pinpoint at the original and the translation. So there are a whole lot of examples I have given. So the point here uh, I am making is through those ways in which translation is always seen as lesser, right? <clears throat> All those terms and concepts that we have listed down, we see how translation itself is at the margin, right? Is at the margin, whereas so-called original is at the center of uh, literary system, not just literary system, but our societal cultural system as well. Um, I don't know if you have come across uh, Foucault's What is an Author? Have you? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I Okay, so there you know uh, how these recent ideas of author, authorship is very closely related to authority, right? So the authority of the author is a um, idea established with the growth of capitalism, with the idea of individualism, right? So the idea of copyright to an individual author. So individual author and copyright and authority of the author is a very recent phenomenon. So what we are talking about, and that is why I have a disclaimer here, since the time of institutionalization of academic disciplines, which is not more than 200 years ago, although universities existed, but individual disciplines came along with colonization, with the coming of capitalism and setting up of more educational higher institutions, right? So the authority of the author is a very, very recent phenomenon in the history of our world. And so the role of translation before this, we are not very clear about that. What we are talking about is applicable, let us say, in the last 300 at the most or at the most 500 years, right? Uh, this is something which I like very much. I always uh, uh, quote Octavio Paz whenever I talk about translation, whenever I teach at translation. And you might have read this uh, when you have read Susan Bassnett, right? So every text is unique. And at the same time, every text is the translation of another text. No text is entirely original because language itself, in its essence, is already a translation. Language is already a translation, firstly, of the non-verbal world, right? Our thoughts, our experiences, these are non-verbal world. And secondly, since every sign, every phase is the translation of another sign and another phase, phrase. However, this argument can be turned around without losing any of its validity. When you turn the argument around, it can mean all texts are original, right? So the first argument is all texts are translations. Second, all texts are also original because every translation is distinctive. Every translation is unique. Every translation up to a certain point is an invention and as such, it constitutes a unique text. So here you have Octavia Paz, a poet, also a politician, so who is saying that nothing in this world is original. No, 
uh, which implies that everything is a translation, but simultaneously, everything is original, everything is unique, right? So things are not black and white. The distinction between translation and original is not at all clear. And therefore, to posit translation as the margin is a very foolish thing to do, perhaps. And to call original as unique and not translation as unique is also a foolish thing to do. Therefore, the line between what is margin, what is central is not clear at all. I mean, this also can be you know, explained using examples. If you think of the first written text in your languages, we don't know the first oral text. Stories have existed as long as human beings have existed, right? Uh, people have told very, very many stories. But, <clears throat> and these may relate to religion. They may not relate to religion. They may relate to your uh, wedding. They may relate to your uh, grinding of uh, grains. They may relate to the food you hunted, the meat you ate, and so on and so forth, right? Songs can be of the hunting. Songs can be of uh, finding some roots. So there could be many, many stories. But when you write down things in your own languages, in Indian languages, what were the first things that were written down? Most languages, Indian languages, you find dominant languages. By dominant languages, I mean now recognized as official. Kannada in uh, Karnataka, Tamil in Tamil Nadu, Telugu in uh, <coughs> Tel or Telangana, Andhra Pradesh and so on. Dominant Indian languages where the first written texts were always a retelling of different epics. It could be Ramayana, it could be Mahabharata, sometimes it could have been the Persian epics, right? Persian epics that were translated. So all were translations. But at that moment in time, these were not known as translations. These were Kamban's Ramayana, for example, in Tamil, is the Ramayana, which is associated with Kamban, it is even today called as Kamban's Ramayana, not a translation of Almiki's Ramayana to Kamban, no. Pampa Bharata in Kannada or Tulsi Das's Ramacharitmanas, right? It is Tulsi Das's Ramacharitmanas. It's not somebody else's Ramayana. So you see that translators and retellings had a different kind of relationship than the question of author as Foucault points out today, right? So every text is kind of, you know, this is true, not just in, in the Indian case, uh, Chaucer also took a whole lot of uh, stories that existed and put them down in Canterbury Tales. Shakespeare, as you know, also took a whole lot of stories from Latin and Greek myths and then put them in this place. So, but they were unique. They were given the authorship. It was not translation. Today, the question of translation is entirely different. It is much more at the margin than before. So, <clears throat> if the first part of the talk uh, is about, oh, I've already crossed 40 minutes, uh, Gaurav. Yeah, so how much time do you think you need to go? Uh, Shall we just uh, quickly, maybe 10 minutes? 10 minutes, that's fine. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So these are the margins I wanted to uh, talk about, uh, starting from uh, how Derrida uh, conceptualizes Tower of Babel. This, have you read this essay? No, we haven't. Okay. Um, and how translation created margins during colonialism, gender and translation, caste and translation, and languages of inequalities. Maybe I'll focus on the three in the middle and forget about the Tower of Babel, uh, <clears throat> where I had uh, uh, mentioned how uh, biblical translation, God's words, couldn't be translated in any other language other than Latin for a long time, right? Translation was punishable. The first English translation, Wycliffe, he was he died just before, before he was executed, but he was persecuted. All his associates were burned. And even Tyndale, who translated the Bible, <clears throat> was executed. You have all such, uh, not just in England, but in Germany and in other places also, translation was of Bible from Latin 
was a punishable criminal act right so this <clears throat> you you see how translation especially of god's words is not at all acceptable and there is a whole lot of concepts of purity sacrosanct original words of gods associated there which is carried down today to us now uh, <clears throat> this is not just in latin if from those days bible has been translated and has become the most translated book but sanskrit it still retains the position of the god's language right much of hindu rituals even today are only in sanskrit even though most people don't understand it right that's because only in that language the purity of god's words or your prayers to god can be carried over and this can be done only by certain people not all of us right so if bible story is takes us to one direction the sanskrit story takes us to another direction translation is not really possible in such cases I mean, not made possible in such cases um so that's a quick thing we can maybe discuss if you have questions about uh, religion and translation uh, later on um translation as the margin translation as producing margin during colonialism who were the translators who first translated from indian languages it is the europeans right whether it is i've mentioned few names but you can look up and there are a whole lot of europeans in the late 18th century starting from 1750s onwards or uh, and 19th century this translation flourished you have a whole lot of europeans largely british and germans who are translating the so called ancient literature of india although ancient literature existed in many languages they translated largely from sanskrit right and to understand what indian civilization was but what happened in this process of translation was that so via translation the indian society or even the eastern society as a whole if you are familiar with edward said's uh, orientalism he posits how the orient was constructed and represented right so it is only via translation that a orient was constructed the images of east as static images of east as superstitious mystic exotic etc etc images that orientalism elaborates upon uh, sides orientalism uh, elaborates upon this was produced only via translation right so what happened on the other side if it presented translation as a very uncivilized kind of a space it also simultaneously made europe the pinnacle the peak of civilization something which others should look up upon right or follow so but in in many very many ways it not just orientalized translation helped in orientalizing uh, the indian and other eastern societies translation also textualized is the background noise too much can you hear the background noise Or no, no there is no noise for us now okay fine um what was the very many practices very many customs very many everydayness of our lives of the very many languages and communities these european translations textualize them as one hindu culture right so translation did many things but overall what translation did was produce the orient produce them as a colonized subject in the margin and it was it became the marginalized other of the colonizer so colonizer versus the colonized the differences between them cultural superiority historical superiority civilizational superiority all this were produced only via translation right so it's of course 
colonialism worked on many many grounds many many foundations but translation is one of the main foundations through which colonialism worked now um, coming to translation and gender like we have just mentioned translation is an invisible act right it's not just an invisible act but the translator themselves they are not visible now we can hardly remember who translated aristotle i mean there might be many right but who translated perumal murugan whom i am reading right now i don't really make unless i make an effort i wouldn't remember so the invisibility of translator lies at various levels now in the public right pretty much like the invisibility of women now your class consists mostly of women so uh, there's not much uh, i can say about it but in general i'm sure you'll agree that the visibility of women in public is can be very comparable to the visibility of translation or the invisibility of translation it's not just the visibility it's also the labor of translation how women's labor is very very um not at all on par right unpaid nature of domestic labor or the care labor the emotional labor again very much like translation who or translator who hardly gets paid in relation to the author so understanding translation as faithful and fidel it's like these are the terms that are usually used in a heterosexual relationship right or uh, you have to be faithful to your partner usually women who have to be faithful to their male partner and translation is also called as reproduction which is again a very gender loaded term and you know women are called as a second sex translation as a second text right a secondary text primary source text original versus secondary reproduction copy text all these are terms that suggest a model universal masculine and translation as the a very feminine invisible imitative kind of an activity not so universal activity as the masculine is will you give me a second uh, this background noise yeah. is irritating me just give me a second. yeah the very terms that are being used are sexualized if you want yeah. that's something i plan to discuss in the next lesson when you are done with your presentation unfortunately we'll just have half a lecture for gender and translation as i've said this twice before it was not intended to be like this the term itself is so limited that everything has to be just like touched upon and then we move on like post colonialism hardly a class one class is hardly justifiable for such a broad theme but yes we'll talk about it and many of these things i'm sure you will come across in your post career yeah yeah sorry i didn't see you come please carry on no i know i'm uh... putting down a whole lot of maybe decades of works on translation colonialism translation gender into you know few slides it's not uh, doesn't do justice at all but yeah even in, in my course this time i was able only to touch upon many of them that's what i was discussing with them given the limited okay. year for this trimester uh, okay. and then i'm sure in their post graduation and further studies they will uh, yeah work on correct yeah as undergrads i think what you have done is pretty uh, good enough so i was talking about gender and translation right so women are also seen as lack especially in a very uh, psychoanalytical kind of uh, reading so <clears throat> women as a lack as lacking a penis so it's very much like seeing translation that lacks something of the original so how do uh, people uh, in fact i like this author a lot there's somebody called karin litov uh, who has talked about uh, gender and translation do we talk about translation in terms of equality because feminism demands equality right and translation also demands equivalence equivalence to the original so so what is equality what is equivalence should you be equal to men should you be equal to original right 
why is male the standard why is original the standard should you be like men right equal to men so there is a tension here right like a mirror's reflection of the original should you be exactly the same man is to woman like a mirror is to the original should it be so faithful right so do we rethink these terms both in uh, feminist uh, ideas and ideas around translation the ideas of equality and equivalence right so let us say people who argue for sameness right in the name of equality basically are erasing differences right so you should notice that it is she is not arguing against erasing of power one should erase the power right but not erase the difference so you you see how what i'm basically trying to say is there are parallels very strong parallels between the way translation is uh, posited positioned in the margins during colonialism and in our own lives which is very very gender you can draw parallels between the way translation is put in the margin and gender and colonized and caste are put in the margin there are strong parallels there so uh, perhaps this is the last uh, slide i'll just uh, quickly go through uh, translation and caste so in recent times uh, if you want to look this up this one essay which is really uh, very very useful to my understanding rita kotari's caste in a casteless language right where she's talking about the how dalit literature is coming to be has come into being via translation uh, so the notion of dalit literature itself right there is a tamil dalit literature there is kannada dalit literature there are dalit literatures emerging from different uh, locations but in the context of india if there is a course on dalit literature in fact if there is a course on indian literature it is made via translation right so any indian literature basically you cannot study indian literature you cannot conceptualize indian literature without translation similarly dalit literature now but what translation has done to dalit literature unlike indian literature perhaps there is a difference that it has given visibility to the marginalized experiences whereas if you can notice in all the previous slides we have seen we have seen how translation is the margin translator is the margin experiences of gender and colonized are the margin but here translation has been a very enabling empowering kind of an activity for the dalit literature because it is via translation that dalit literatures have got a visibility translation has been a tool for mobility for people for people of the oppressed caste right and it has moved their politics from the local to the global and by being visible the politics is much larger so it's not just being visible so far until the last 20 30 years if you talked about indian literature it would have been literature only from the very privileged caste you look at any of the translations available of indian literature any of the translations taught in universities until last 20 30 years if you count the 2000 years of indian literary history you would find hardly any marginalized experience so it is via translation that much it's not just caste but also true for gender to many extent so but women from india who were diasporic largely right they have talked about the brown women experiences so english has also been a vehicle of mobility for many for women and uh, oppressed caste but if you as i said last 50 years or so has been very what do you say uh, uh, the last 50 years has been quite markedly different in the history of translation 
and in the history of marginalized experiences expressed through translation. Now, the second part of this is uh, how English makes it possible, right? Translation into English and what has English done? English as an enabling factor for many of us uh, that perhaps I will uh, skip and maybe we can discuss this if you have a question. But thank you so much for listening. Uh, almost an hour I have taken and I hope I have made some sense. Thank you, Gaurav, for this opportunity. Uh, although I didn't get to know the names, maybe now if you have any questions, you can just tell me your names and then talk. Most of it, Samia, but before, you, uh, before we open this for uh, question and answer, maybe yeah. just speak a minute. Uh, the last thing that you uh, sort of skipped about uh, how English uh, leads to sort of a mobility, and I think you have a quote from Ambedkar. So I yeah. was in that because last time we were we had started talking about uh, post-colonialism and translation and mm -hmm. something about, we just started talking about gender and translation. I gave the example of uh, Asia Jeba, who is a Francophone writer from Algeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, the choice, her choice of writing, not in the language of the colonial master, which is mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a choice of writing in the language of the colonial master, which is French and not her particular language, which is uh, Arabic, because mm -hmm. it allowed her a certain... Um, uh, how to put it, space to express many things which were quite right. intimate uh, questions of sexuality, etc., challenges to face. Right. So maybe you can also dwell on this for three, four minutes. I think the audience will also be patient enough for this last section. Okay. So okay. Uh, yeah, uh, that's quite an interesting parallel, in fact, uh, because before we read this, or maybe we should just uh, read this quote from Ambedkar, uh, who didn't talk about translation or literature, but it is very much, very much there, right? So Ambedkar, uh, <clears throat> writing in 1946, this uh, text from where I uh, picked his quote, I have already been warned that, that I can't read that something. I, I'll is... I'll I'll okay, it. yeah. Uh, Ambedkar on translation, I have already been warned that while I may have a right to speak on Indian politics, religion, and religious history of India, are not my field and that I must not enter it. I am ready to admit that I am not competent to speak even on Indian politics. If the warning is for the reason that I cannot play mastery over the Sanskrit language, I admit this deficiency. But I do not see why it should disqualify me altogether from operating in this field. There is very little of literature in the Sanskrit language which is not available in English. The want of knowledge of Sanskrit need not therefore be a bar to my handling a theme such as the present. For I venture to say that a study of the relevant literature, albeit in English translation, for 15 years ought to be enough to invest when a person endowed with such moderate intelligence like myself with, uh, with sufficient degree of, uh, can't see the last. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, competence for the task. Sufficient degree yeah. of competence for the task. Yeah. So this is Ambedkar who when uh, was accused of not knowing Sanskrit. I mean, that is quite a irony, right? It's not, it's not that Ambedkar uh, didn't know uh, Sanskrit or even if he wanted to know, he was not allowed to know uh, Sanskrit. It's only in recent times that Sanskrit has opened up, but until... I, I can't even say 100 years, but Sanskrit was not accessible to everyone, right? So you can't accuse of a person whom you didn't want to learn Sanskrit of not knowing Sanskrit. But then he, the translations are available and those translations are done by people who knew Sanskrit, right? Translator, translator by both Brahmin men and also European men of what uh, Ambedkar did. So of uh, what Ambedkar read. So 15 years of reading in translation, of translations which were done by very knowledgeable people. If that is not enough, what is enough is what Ambedkar is asking. So it's a kind of validation of translation, legitimation of translation, and also questioning who is the translator. If you think I don't know Sanskrit, then who translated it, right? Aren't they valid enough to translate? And therefore, he's putting back the putting the ball back into their court. 
So yes, the example that uh, Gaurav gave of this Algerian writer who choose to write in English, right, Gaurav? That's what I understood. No, in French. In French. We're talking about oh, sorry, in French. In French and not in Arabic. The writer chose to write in the language of the colonizer and not so-called one's own language because that gave her a right or freedom to express herself which she couldn't have done in Arabic. It's a very, very parallel scenario which many Dalit writers have spoken about, right? In fact, not just Dalit writer, but also writers from many smaller languages of India have been talking about. Now, what kind of writing when you write in Tamil or when you write in Malayalam or in Hindi, right? There's a very standardized version of a textual language. It's not the language that you are used to speaking at home. And even the language that is spoken at home, Nirav Patel, uh, I don't know if there are uh, Gujaratis uh, in the class, but Nirav Patel is a Gujarati poet who writes mm -hmm. both in Gujarati and in English. So Nirav Patel says, the standardized Gujarati, this is the point I was uh, trying to make, a mother tongue with M and mother tongue with the small case EM. Right? So this Gujarati, which is standardized, which is standardized means that that language is largely associated with the language of the privileged caste, which is Sanskritized, right? So when you write down, it is Sanskritized and it is accessible to, you know, when you, when you study uh, Telugu in schools, it's so very difficult, made difficult than the Telugu you speak at home, right? The textualized Hindi is so very alienated from what you have, what you speak at home. So, what is textualized, institutionalized is with the cap M, caps M, and what you speak is with the lowercase M. So, Nero Patel says how the language he grew up in a Dalit Basti, what he spoke at home, the objects around him, the occupation that uh, his parents were involved in and the experience of caste. He's a Dalit uh, poet, Dalit writer. The experiences of caste were so very different and the language is built around your everyday life, right? So that itself is so different from the language that was taught in schools with the caps G of Gujarati. So that formal, textual, standardized, privileged language I don't want to claim it as my mother tongue. Although both are called Gujarati, one is with a small case, one is with a caps case. So Nero Patel says, I, that's not my mother tongue. I rather write and be translated in a foster tongue, which is English. Right? I will chuck my mother tongue because it has never given me recognition. Even when I write in Gujarati, people often compare and say how this Gujarati is not an acceptable Gujarati. It's not a nice Gujarati. Right? And therefore, I prefer English. And it's not just because they dismiss my writing in Gujarati, but in English gives me a visibility, recognition, which Gujarati doesn't give. It is steeped in local politics. Right? I can, I mean, I'm sure many women also find it much easier, women who know English, to write about their sexuality in English. It's a language that is easier to express in, which you cannot express in your own languages, right? So in that sense, translation into English for both women all of all castes and Dalit women and men, English and English translation has been a very powerful, enabling, empowering tool. Yes, I will stop here. Thank you very much. So I think we can have questions now. Please come. You will have to come up here. Okay. Yeah. okay. Hello. Hi. First of all, thank you for your talk. Uh, I think just speak. Yes. Let the voice be heard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my question was on the idea of orality. Mm -hmm. uh, because in these epic traditions that are centered around like the Indian subcontinent, translations throughout like orality has been a very important thing through the, the way the stories have been 
uh, passed on, right? And it's only now because literacy in in the subcontinent is again a very modern idea, if you may. So, like, how would you understand the idea of postcoloniality in the traditions which are very oral? And I'm not just talking about like standardization of Ramayana, Mahabharata, but also like Adivasi traditions in that sense because they also have taken to writing English because like the armed like the resistance against like um. Uh, the discrimination and the oppression but then uh, what about the oral traditions and how do we conceptualize that in uh, the context of post-colonial translation yeah um i uh, i mean I, I this is a difficult connection to make uh, orality and uh, post-colonialism um uh Orality and colonialism seems very easy, uh, but orality and post-colonialism, uh, I actually have to think through this. But I can tell you one thing, um, post-colonial theory, I think it focused on particular identities a little too much uh, in the sense, uh, even when, I, I, are you familiar with Tejaswini Niranjana, who worked oh. on translation and post-colonial? So when you look at... Uh, Okay, let me put it this way. So what post-colonial scholars did, uh, uh, if you look at post-colonial scholars of literature, whether it is Pivak or uh, Tejaswini Niranjana or Baba or um, Chandra Talpade Mohanty and so on and so forth, right? One, most of them were located in the US. All these post-colonial scholars writing were located in the US. And there is an anxiety that their identity is not as recognized, right? Wherever they were located. And you have a whole lot of post-colonial writing coming from that kind of a position, which focused on particular identities, but generalized as a Indian or a brown or a third world identity, or as a post-colonial identity, if you so wish. Right. In that process, there is a glorification of the Indian identity that happens, an Indian identity that was sidelined by the colonizer. What did the post-colonial do? Basically foreground the resistance of the colonized, basically foreground the identity of the colonized as equally superior and not as inferior as the colonizer did, right? The post-colonialism uh, is all about the question of the post-colonial identity, the colonized identity. So in that process of foregrounding the colonized identity as equal or perhaps better than the colonizers, only particular identities got to be focused. Now, in that process, the interior colonization, the internal colonization within, let's say, India, within South Asia, be it of gender colonization or caste colonization, got sidelined. Now, as you rightly pointed out, literacy is a very recent kind of an act or a possibility that is available to all of us right, in the last hundred years or so, literacy was made available to everybody. Until then, it was not even accessible. No, in fact, it's not just in South Asia, pretty much everywhere in the world, other than indigenous societies where orality was the mode of knowledge. So orality as the mode of knowledge existed in pockets in indigenous societies, in tribal Adivasi societies, accessible to all. But in caste-based systems, race-based systems, it was only a very, very minor percentage that could read and write. So what post-colonialism did to orality with the spread of literacy, I think the internal kind of colonization became much aware of what is happening. It is, colonialism is bad, but yes, our own system also need to be addressed. I think orality moved towards a particular kind of literacy, 
but it is also not true that to say only talk about adivasi communities as only oral in fact much of our the world is oral because literacy and elite literacy has been very limiting it's very few people who could read and write even today very few people have the skill to read but lesser people have the skill to write so <clears throat> orality is present among everywhere but <clears throat> there is no completely oral society or a completely literal literate society it's a mix but i think post colonialism actually ignited the <clears throat> largely oral communities into saying how their positions are changing and what the local elites have done i may be totally wrong and i am just thinking aloud here but yeah we'll have to think through this much more i don't even know if i answered your question sorry uh other questions yes please if you want to even take the chair so you don't have to okay um uh, i really like your presentation thank you so much i i like the part on sex and gender quite a bit um it reminded me of like we're doing john milton i do a course in john milton right now and like the whole eve being um derived from adam's rib business uh -huh. yeah it kind of reminded me of that and um yeah so my question was in with regards to adaptation so what what do you do you think there's like there's a difference between adaptation or is it like a subset of translation or what is the relationship between the two ideas uh, adaptation from uh, literary works into films or adaptation of any kind any kind i mean yes. i mean i am I'm like focusing on film from york but also like any kind no i i i wouldn't say it's a sub section or a sub variety of translation i think all adaptations are translations yeah of one of whatever kind right and not just that i mean as i said it is uh, <clears throat> i don't believe in the idea of the original so uh, even that is an adaptation of whatever so that that's yeah everything is an adaptation like i quoted paz a little while ago okay other questions no uh i'll have one last question and uh, i hope i don't take too much of your time so um, uh, i was reading uh, terry egelton in the context of uh, what is literature so he yeah. mentioned somewhere that the idea that everything is a literature basically make the idea of literature or the term literature itself quite unusable so i relate Un to the unusable because if everything if you say Un everything unusable yeah it doesn't mean much because if you say everything is literature every kind of text is literature so i don't want to go into that debate but that just reminded me of what sometimes we in 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 what terms we talk about translation and i'll relate this with what, what octavio paz has said uh, in his quote he says somewhere um, just give me a second i'll note it somewhere yeah language in itself for translation first of all of the non verbal world to the verbal world now if we take Uh, if we make the sort of definition of translation i'm not trying to drive at a definition but still i'm using it the word for sake of convenience yeah. if if we take the if they stretch the definition of translation so much that it, that we apply it to the non verbal to the verbal kind of transfer thought to words for example then doesn't it mean that translation everything becomes translation so if somebody ask me can you say what is translation what kind of i don't know if i uh question is coherent but i hope i have given a sense yeah, of what yeah. no i i got it this is also a critique of deconstruction because when this deconstruction talks of there is no one single meaning you can deconstruct it into multiple meanings or the meaning is always deferred right the, the, the you can never reach the uh, meaning there is no actual meaning to anything uh, there is a critique of it similarly yeah i think this is also a critique emerging from that in fact uh, karin litter who just uh, i just mentioned who is talking about gender and translation has a very interesting take on this uh, what she says is it's not just that one anything can be translation it's just that one you are breaking down the power and hierarchy between original and translation that's the first task right by saying that everything can be translation understood as translation first you are breaking the hierarchy the power between anything right whether man woman or translation and the original uh, so there is a deconstruction of power there second 
instead of limiting the meaning right instead of limiting the gender into a binary of man and woman into uh, instead of limiting the binary in our literary system into original and translation we are actually having a multiplicity of meanings we are taking the meaning that what we want right there is a multiplicity it's not just that even though i may in this context use translation in a particular way in another context i can i myself can use translation in another way now with the coming of ott almost everything you see on the screen is has subtitles now is that translation yes i think so so in that particular translation yeah, in that particular context yes whatever somebody speaks is translated into a verbal from the verbal to the written right so that even thought into the written world thought into the speech uh, world utterance is a translation so given a context so we have a multiplicity of meanings which we can use we can choose and choice is always a good thing so i think instead of going nowhere there is a choice for us from where we can choose from this kind of an understanding right uh no other questions okay yeah pranita yes yeah. there is one more question Hello, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, after you brought up the point of multiplicity, I was wondering how uh, translation changes perception of certain texts or literature, uh, oral or anything, uh, within the same language. Like, if I were to translate an older, um, say, Tamil text to like the modern context, and I try to change the narrative or even like my choice of words would be different from what it was before so how does that contribute to multiplicity and how um how does that also alter the perception of originality and um, variation and stuff like that yeah yeah thank you for that question uh, in fact uh, I mean, I've been using Karin Lito a lot, right? In her, her argument about multiplicity emerges from a translation of a myth. Uh, have you heard of Pandora's box? Yeah, they're yeah, saying uh, it. Yes. So Pandora's box has both gifts and poison, right? Uh, <clears throat> it has all good and evil. So it has all kinds of things. It is a chaotic kind of a box. You are not supposed to open it. In fact. Uh, the translation of this myth of pandora's box in european history is multiple this is where karin lito is analyzing this translation people have translated it into very many ways and all men have translated this right and they have changed the latin version of it and latin version was available in writing <clears throat> from a oral version of it so there are ways in with mythologies have come to us which is very gendered is what karin uh, is uh, lito is arguing and therefore and within those existing translations of latin and french and english there are multiple versions but it only recent times when writing has become much more available accessible one version is more popular than the other Right? but even this can be kind of argued look at the story of draupadi which is now written in from different positions or the story of sita if you look up online there are different stories of sita or uh, i i asked you i told you about ak ramanujan's uh, 300 ramayana it's a very short piece but i think you should read it so there are multiple kind of ramayanas available and they just give us interesting multiple viewpoints and we can use them as we want in fact in one of the stories uh, hanuman is reciting another idea of ramayana himself right uh, this is coming from hanuman and it's very interesting because then rama is dead in that story and hanuman is then 
telling Rama story. So you, you, you can just, I, I think this multiplicity just adds to our pool of knowledge and ideas. Any other questions? Okay. So I think we'll conclude now. Uh, thank you so much, Samya, for uh, agreeing to do this. Uh, it was quite illuminating, quite engaging. I think the students also uh, liked it. So thank you very much for your time.